All right, hello everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 21, uh, weekly JavaScript podcast bringing you all the best news you might have missed over the week. And uh, before we get, in, uh, we get started with the actual news, I want to say that uh, by your request, BXGS Weekly is now going to be published on SoundCloud and Castbox. So if you want to listen it without video or don't want to watch it on Twitch, don't want to watch it, uh, blah. words are hard when it's 30. <laughs> God damn it. Let me try that again. So words are hard when it is plus 35 degrees outside. It is 8 p.m. here and it is hot as hell. Uh, hey, Dash, welcome to the stream. So as I was saying, if you don't want to watch it with the video, if you don't want to watch it on YouTube, if you don't want to watch it on Twitch, whatever, you are now able to just listen to it on SoundCloud and CastBox. The links are in a um, current episode and I will put them everywhere where I basically can reach. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let me know if you want to see any other services uh, that, you know, basically I should upload it to because I am open to suggestions, as I always say. Thanks for the help earlier. Yeah, sure, always welcome. Uh, if you guys need help, join our Discord server. We are a friendly bunch. <laughs> sometimes and uh, yes we'll be uh, happy to help you with just about any javascript problems you have all right um let us get started with the news then right we actually have quite a bunch of things today and uh, quite a lot of pretty major releases actually seems like people are back from their vacation so let's get started and see what we have in stock for today and for this week uh, so the first article we got is from the node source guys it's called the age of node.js and and it talks about the fact that uh, like since the node.js release since the uh, whole like development and everything the white the node being so widespread the node became uh, sort of the this kind of ubiquitous entity that is now everywhere and you almost never talk about Node.js as a singular thing. You always talk about uh, talk about Node.js in uh, some context. You talk about Node.js and React, Node.js and server-side rendering, Node.js and serverless functions, Node.js and something else. And uh, the article basically talks about this. And uh, the interesting part is that, like, yeah, there's like perspectives of, you know, the backend engineer says that Node.js community is the services, the libraries, the OS. Well, the build infrastructure engineer will tell you this is V8, C++, Git, LibUV, OpenSSL, and so on and so on. Like, it is really fascinating how many things Node.js can do and how ubiquitous it became. And um, there's also like a bunch of other very interesting thoughts in this article, especially talking about that, you know, the Node.js at times become invisible, like people are building apps without even knowing that they use Node.js, right? So like if you use build tools, you're not necessarily are aware of how they work, especially with this new fancy UIs, for example, for React builders. Um, hey, Griswold, welcome to the stream. So yes, it is a very interesting sort of meta article about the node and its ecosystem and its development. And uh, yeah, it's like, do give it a read if you're interested in the whole node universe. Hey, Veslav, uh, welcome to the stream. Yes, uh, I mean, you know, I try to announce it as, as, as much as possible, but the Discord and Twitter, I think, is the most places where I announce the streams like this. Obviously, the Twitch itself, if you subscribe to notifications, but that's a different question. All right, so this is the first article we get. Let us continue. The next thing we got is supercharge your debugging experience for Node.js. Essentially, a sort of a tutorial talking about how exactly do you debug a Node.js apps, right? Starting with a very basic approach by, hey, Node actually has a built-in inspector and you can just uh, enable it and then open the Chrome and attach to your Node process. Chrome, by the way, now has this really neat Node button if it detects your Node app. And then you can just debug, right? So it's a nice tutorial on how to do that. Um, and uh, also talks about like using debugger in uh, VS Code or uh, WebStorm or whatever the IDE you use. And it also talks about the new tool from Google called NDB. We're going to talk about it a bit later once we get to the uh, library section, which is actually looks pretty damn good. But uh, that's going to save it for a bit later. So let's continue. 
Next article we got is stateful monads in JavaScript part one. So as you might imagine, this article talks about stateful monads. Uh, this is specifically the article working with a library called Crocs. I think I already covered one of its, like the similar articles, I think from the same author a um, few podcasts ago. And uh, I don't remember what exactly it was about, but it was also like the Crocs seems to be like this functional programming library. And uh, yeah, so this basically talks about the stateful monads, what starting with what the monads are. Oh, God, words are hard today, as I said, it's too damn hot. All right, starting with what the monads are, right? And talking about, okay, so what are the stateful monads and how are they useful? What can you do with them in JavaScript? And how exactly do you work with them using the Crocs library? So if you are interested in functional programming and specifically understanding monads, then this article might give you a pretty good starting point, at least maybe you maybe you will not understand the monads completely because I mean, this is not an easy topic. Um, and especially if you don't have a very strong mathematical background, right? So I think it took me a couple of weeks to figure out how this stuff works. But it can give you a good start. So do have a look. All right, next thing we got is physics engine in your JavaScript program. Essentially a tutorial on using Matter.js um, open source engine that allows you to do different things. Like there's a pretty nice demos here of, you know, just coding a ball that would have physics and then adding the surface that the ball would collide with. And then adding some more complicated things like the cart with two wheels and the um, pendulums. Uh, it looks quite nice. I mean, the tutorial itself is pretty straightforward. There's like literally 20 lines of JavaScript for everything here, but you know, if you are looking to build something like this and uh, you don't want to invent your own uh, physics engine, then this might be the thing for you. Okay, continuing, we got create a draggable opacity changing circle with reanimated in React Native. So it's a React Native tutorial on creating a draggable circle that would just change the properties of circle. Um, for whatever reason, using reanimated animation library, like you could do this by just using the coordinates, but I guess this is more of a tutorial for the reanimated itself. Uh, but you know, there's nothing uh, out of ordinary here. So as you expect, if you ever try to do dragging things in React Native, you would know exactly how it works. And then there's going to be a tiny bit that would basically uh, work with reanimated. I mean, it does add a nice interpolation, for example. So. Uh, I guess there's that. So yeah, if you're, you know, if this sounds like something you want to learn, then do have a look. It is not a bad article. Right. Next thing we got is a, another article from Google developers team called page life cycle API. And it is about the new page life cycle APIs that just shipped in Chrome 68. That's just been uh, released recently. And, uh, is it 68 or wait a sec? I'm confused. Is it 68 already? Did I miss? Yes, it is 68. Did I spell 58 in the article? Oh God. Okay. <laughs> Let, just give me a second. I screwed up. It's not, that is, that is very old. That is not what should be here. There we go. That is what I want to do. <laughs> live, live editing, live, live debugging and production. There we go. All right, yeah, so it talks about the page lifecycle APIs in Chrome 68, which adds additional lifecycle hook for the pages so that your uh, JavaScript app can actually react to the user interaction and the browser change uh, accordingly, which basically brings the whole web, uh, web apps and progressive web apps world closer to the, well, that's not what I wanna press, closer to the native world, right? So right now we have, um, like you already had things like on Blur, on uh, Focus, Visibility Change, Page Show, Page Hide and stuff like this, right? So they've added a bunch more. For example, there is now a frozen state, which would mean that, you know, something has actually uh, frozen and, you know, the task queue is clogged. And um, I believe it also is called on unfrozen. Yeah, so uh, there's basically if you are doing some CPU intensive computations, I guess, then this is what you want to listen for. Uh, the article does talk about all of this in pretty in depth. So if you are interested in sort of making your app more resilient, I guess, uh, or maybe adding some additional login to see how it behaves on other people's computers, this is a very good one. Um, the only thing I'm curious about is that whether those uh, page states are in the spec because the <laughs> 
Chrome guys, unfortunately, are notorious about putting things that are known in the web spec into their browser, right? That's why we have all this Borg's best in Chrome bullshit. That is something that I don't really enjoy. And uh, the question is, yeah. Um, hey, Samahavits, welcome to the stream. Privet. Um, you, I know you was trying to force me to speak Russian on the stream for some time, but there you go. There's your chance. Right. Um, but yeah, so basically, if you're interested in the events, do have a look at this one. Uh, it is uh, quite in depth. I do wonder if there's any compatibility. Com no, this, they don't talk about compatibility, which is um, slightly annoying, I guess, but whatever. Right, let's continue. The next thing we got is why Discord is sticking with the React Native. For once, we got a React Native article that actually talks about company sticking to it instead of switching to something else. And uh, like, it's not extremely big, but it does talk about all the points that uh, they like about React Native. And well, if you ever use Discord on mobile, you know it's pretty well built and works quite nicely. And the thing is that Discord is a perfect use case for React Native. There's like nothing incredibly complicated about it. It's pretty straightforward and it's very easy to build in React Native, right? So obviously you would need to go an extra mile to make it, to make it as nice as the Discord itself is, but hey, you know, they did it and it works very nice. There's even comparison with uh, Facebook Messenger, for example that um, doesn't really animate the keyboard as nicely and Discord does, which is kind of amusing. So there's actually better UI animations in a React Native app than in a native uh, Facebook app. On the other hand, Facebook apps are not exactly that good. So, all right, let's continue. Next thing we got is what is happening with the pipeline proposal. Um, so there's been some changes to the pipeline proposal. Uh, I think it's been reworked again and I I don't think it's been moved in the status basically, so it's still stage uh, one, I believe. But they did change quite a bunch of things. It's now like basically breaking changes. And there's a lot of talks happening about um, some things. And this article basically goes to talk about what are those things. So like, for example, the async await handling. So how do you, how do you desugar the X pipeline await F? Should it be a weight F from X or should it be a weight F? And then basically whatever F is, it should be executed on X. So it's it's a tricky question and it's definitely worth talking about. And that's basically there's a proposed solutions are also discussed. I personally like a lot the F sharp pipelines because F sharp is a purely functional language and um, it does bring a lot of like C sharp and uh, Microsoft.NET team expertise on the table. I think they did a very good job on making it work because I mean, uh, C sharp and .NET also has a sync await, right? I believe F sharp also does this. And um, the way they handle it is essentially you can pipe your promise into just a wait and then you pipe further the already awaited solution into something, right? That works relatively well. And um, yeah, there's also the question of placeholders how do you do like partial application and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it is very curious. Like I am this, as I already said multiple times, the pipeline operator proposal is something I'm extremely excited about. I think it's an incredible addition, especially when you write a lot of uh, things in functional style, but yeah, let's go, let's just see how all of that resolves because there is a lot of questions here. I wouldn't call them issues. It's just things to solve basically, but Luckily for us, luckily for JavaScript, there is a lot of existing implementations that already solved at least some of those issues. So um, yeah, if you're interested in pipeline proposal, do have a look at this Babel post, uh, or I guess team uh, post from the Babel team. It is quite interesting. Right, next thing we got is introduction to property-based testing. Last time I showed you the fast check library that was the JavaScript implementation of quick check framework from Haskell and it was the property-based testing. And I had some people um, in Discord ask me like, hey, what's what's the property-based testing actually? What is it about? Well, there you go. Luckily for you, there is an article. It's actually not new. It's like from 23rd of March, but I thought, uh, you know, since a lot of people are asking, I'm just gonna put it in here since uh, the BXGS weekly didn't really exist back then. So we are gonna um, have a look at it now. So this um, article explains what is property-based testing what are the benefits and how do you actually use the fast check library to do it? So if you are interested, I'm not going to go in details here. 
But if you're interested, just go ahead and read the article. It does give you all the basics you need to know to start doing it. Right, next article we got is simple setup for a React application with Webpack 4 and CSS and SAS, or SAS, I guess. Uh, so it's an article from Dev2 that talks about setting up Webpack uh, from scratch. So this is something that I don't think at this stage you actually need to do because there is like uh, React create app, there is Next.js, there is uh, Nuke.js, there is like a billion of wrappers and frameworks that do that for you, right? So it's at uh, this point you don't really need to do that. But what I think is, and uh, for example, I know when the uh, Webpack was just released, I had to do it uh, all on my own. So I had to learn all of that stuff. I had to learn the Webpack dev server, Webpack configs, and how to set it up with the Babel loaders, all that kind of stuff. And uh, the thing is, it's I think it's important to know anyway. So even if you're going to use one of those wrappers, if you even if you're going to use one of those frameworks, create React app. Yes, did I say React? Create, like, okay, it's just it's hard to say. <laughs> it's it's confusing. So that thing, that command line thing, let's just call it this way. So let us continue. Um, yeah, so as I, as I was saying, even if you use the frameworks, at some point there will be uh, likely, like if your project grows large enough, there will be a need to edit the config and either extend it or change it completely. Like, right, uh, maybe you want to add some custom loader that will pre-process something. Or maybe you want to implement features that are not yet implemented by the community. Maybe you want to add your own extension. And at that moment, you will need to understand how Webpack works, how the config works, how do you use loaders, and so on and so forth. So there you go. There's an article that will basically teach you a very basic setup with all of that stuff, uh, which is quite, like, as I said, in my opinion, it's quite important to know all of that, even if you don't do that afterwards. Um, on the other hand, we got Parcel.js that has literally zero config and does just about everything that you can do with Webpack. Uh, they actually promised a new release, like major release, that will be as flexible in configuration as Webpack. So I'm kind of pretty excited to see what they will come up with. Right, let us continue. The next thing we got is developing real-time web application with server sent events. Um, now, this is an interesting one because it talks about the spec that I did not know existed. Uh, so this article basically made me learn quite a few interesting things. So there is apparently a server sent events spec that is uh, actually like right now is in uh, what WG, right? The, the um, non... Um, so not W3C, basically the browser coalition thing. And it's quite actively updated. And the idea of this spec is that basically the, the uh, browser can subscribe to some sort of a server source, and then the server will push the events to the browser. So it's sort of the pops up uh, scheme of work, right? And uh, I guess you could say it's similar to WebSockets, but simpler. So I, I, ha I still haven't had time to look at the uh, actual spec and the actual implementation to figure out how is it different from, for example, using WebSockets. But the fact that you can do it relatively easily, right? So all you need in the client is literally to create this, um, where's the example? To create this event source, there you go. And then to subscribe to event, that's it. That's all it takes. It's really, really easy. Then you will get those server side events and you can react to them in some way, whatever the way you want, right? So show notifications or change the UI. Um, it seems to be very simple. The server side though, like in this example, they use the um, HTTP, node HTTP core package, which is, well, as you might imagine, it's not quite that easy to write uh, code with it. So you have to write a lot of things yourself, like, you know, writing headers, writing responses. Seems like the data is actually separated uh, by the double line breaks, which feels a bit weird, I guess, but, um, you know, whatever works. So if you abstract it into a nice package, that should be um, quite nicer. But yeah, basically, if you are interested in looking into the server send events, which sounds like a actually a pretty neat feature. So it's like, again, web moving closer and closer to the uh, sort of native feel and native capabilities, right? Uh, do have a look at this. This seems to be pretty neat. I also need to read that a bit more carefully because I haven't had time to do that. And look at the source code. They, they do have the source published on GitHub. <clears throat> right. Um, 
Isn't the difference with the WebSockets that WebSockets can also be sent from the client? That is true. So it's one way communication. The thing, so what I'm thinking is like, what is the advantage of using the event source instead of WebSockets when WebSockets basically give you a duplex connection when this only gives you one way connection, right? So I, I like, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess like, I think there's in spec, there was some sort of a resume, like resume mechanism. So you can actually, if the client disconnects, it will, you will be able to resume from a specific point and stuff like this. But I just, I can't, I, I can't comment really. So I haven't read enough um, into the spec to basically answer that. <laughs> But it is it is really interesting and I definitely want to know more about it. So maybe we'll do a live stream about it at some point. Okay, continuing. The next article we got is HTTP requests compared. Why Axios is better than node fetch. First of all, that is not how I would call the article because well, Axios is not really better than node fetch. It's just different. Node fetch is literally a polyfill and it is literally just a fetch spec in the Node.js. Um, but this article talks about what Axios is, how do you use it, and what kind of neat features does it has? Like, for example, automatic transformation of JSON data if JSON header is detected, or uh, automatic XSRF protection, or better error handling, or uh, interceptors, or whatever the other features of the Axios are. Like, I've used Axios in a couple of projects and is a very nice request library, but I would not say that it's better than node like fetch polyfill for node.js. This is not not the best way to put it, you know, not the best way to present it. It's like literally everything would be better than a fetch polyfill. Like, come on, what are, what are you even talking about? I have started using God today uh, instead of node fetch. Yes, God is also very nice. I've used it in, uh, I think I'm using it as an, in the exoframe. So it's quite feature rich and I believe it's, it, it, what, isn't it from Cindrosaurus? Yes, it is. So it's from Mr. Cindrosaurus and it is very, very good. And you know, this guy knows how to build software. Right, um, like next article we got is, well, it's not strictly uh, JavaScript related, but it is node related, let's put it this way. It's called deploying a stateful application on Google Cloud Kubernetes engine and essentially talks about setting up your own Ghost instance, Ghost being the Node.js um, open source blogging platform using the Kubernetes. So if you never worked with Kubernetes, it's sort of, um, how, do, how do I describe it? So there's Docker. Docker is the thing that creates contain, like with it, you, you can put your apps into containers and then deploy those containers into Docker, right? So Kubernetes takes, takes this up a notch and um, as, as one of the students uh, mentioned was like, hey, Kubernetes is basically more complicated Docker, which I guess is not exactly wrong, <laughs> but it's basically the Kubernetes is what Google uses for their infrastructure, right? It's way, way more complicated than Docker, but it also allows you way uh, to do way more things. And um, so right now the Google released this Google Cloud Kubernetes, um, wait, no, that, that's wrong. I think Google Cloud Kubernetes engine is the Kubernetes itself essentially. They recently released a new Kubernetes. Oh, yeah, there was the on-site Kubernetes thing, but whatever. That's that's a different story. So let's um, talk about the tutorial itself. So it talks about setting up the uh, Kubernetes cluster in Google Cloud. So you're going to be using Google Cloud specifically for this. You can set up Kubernetes locally as well. If you are running in dev mode, so if you just want to play around with it, by the way, you can just install Docker for Windows, Docker for Mac, and they have a literally one button that you just press and it, it says like create Kubernetes cluster and it just creates a Kubernetes cluster for you. So you don't even have to do anything. You just point your Kubernetes uh, command line tool to it and then work with it, which is really convenient uh, if you want to play with it. Uh, so, and then it talks about creating the uh, deployment YAML, which is the deployment config, which uh, first of all, deploys the ghost in a very simple way. So by default, um, Kubernetes, I, I don't think, is it by default? I think, yeah, by default, Kubernetes uses Docker containers. Once again, I'm not Kubernetes expert. I literally barely touched it. So if I'm saying something wrong, feel free to correct me. But in this case, they are also using Docker containers. So they create a basic uh, Ghost instance that uses Ghost uh, Docker container without any third-party databases. In that case, Ghost uses SQLite instance, so they basically everything is in one container, which is convenient for starters. 
And then uh, they basically, yes, add volume to persist the data, and then they extend it and add proper MySQL instance, and then they scale it and all that kind of stuff. So basically, if you are interested in large scale deployments, and I guess, you know, I mean, it is very, so <laughs> let me put it this way. I always found it very interesting to play with stuff like this. And this is how I got very fond of Docker, but uh, Docker is very simple, right? You can just take it and use it in one machine, one node without too many problems. Kubernetes on the other hand is uh, essentially Mastodon. So it's like, it's an extremely huge thing and highly likely that you will never need something like this. And you will be like, Docker Swarm would be enough for what you do. On the other hand, it won't hurt to learn something like this and to know how exactly it works because there are a lot of concepts like pods and uh, services and um, hell if I remember all of them. It's like Kubernetes introduces like 25 more concepts over Docker, I think it's like a lot of them. But yes, um, if you are interested in learning the basics of Kubernetes, I mean, I guess, again, they talk about deploying into Google Cloud, but you can do it locally as well. So that's not a big problem. And this article does gives you a pretty good introduction. Right, next thing we got is logging activity with the Web Beacon API, yet another browser API I did not know about. I don't even know if it's new or not, but apparently the browser has the Beacon API, which is essentially an API that allows you to fire off a request to server without waiting for a response, meaning that it's gonna be non-blocking, so you can just fire something off and forget about it. So the browser won't wait for response, the browser won't care, it will just fire off the request. Once the request is done, we we'll just clean up everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the plus, the, the, the advantages of that is first of all, you don't block the queue, right? So you can just uh, wait, like you can just fire something off and don't care about blocking the user interaction. And second of all, it's quite fast. Um, like the use cases are obviously the tracking and analytics. This is the straightforward one. And debugging and logging is also something that you could do, right? Because the beacons are very cheap, essentially. So you can actually send logs to server in this way. Uh, and there are a bit more in depth a look in the article on why the, you know, why is it better than a XHR request? Why is it better than fetch and so on and so forth. So the API is super straightforward. You just have this navigator dot send beacon URL and data method that uh, literally just sends whatever you pass to it to the server. It can be blob, it can be buffer, it can be form data or URL search params, anything that uh, fetch takes, right? So I believe it's, it's probably a wrapper for fetch, it seems. Just, you know, the very stripped one. Um, and yeah, so um, it talks about using it. The tutorial itself is pretty easy. And they also talk about the important part, the do not track header and compliance with the GDPR law and stuff like this, which I think is quite important for, especially if we talk about tracking and things like this, you know? So I, guess, I wonder if debugging falls under GDPR. And if you actually have to, if you send logs to the server, you have to ask consent from the user. That's a, it's a tricky one. But yeah, so if you're interested in the Beacon API, do have a look at this article, it is pretty good. DevOps engineers are the real heroes of our time. That That is absolutely true. Like. If you don't have a DevOps team and you have to do DevOps yourself, I mean, it is doable, but man, it is it is a hard job. Just let me just tell you. All right, uh, let us continue. Build a state management system with vanilla JS is the next article we have. And it is exactly what you would imagine. It is a very basic state management, um, I guess, yes, yeah, system would be a good to component that is written in vanilla ES6. So it uses classes, it uses a pops up approach, and it also is basically wired up to a very basic uh, DOM rendering, again, using vanilla JavaScript without any fancy framework. So if you ever wanted to deeper understand the state management and to build your own solution to you know basically figure out how that works, then this article is for you. All right. Next article we got is React versus the React Context API. Um, React Context versus Redux, which to use and why. Um, so first of all, the title, this is not, not how you should name articles. Um, it does like literally you, uh, where do I start? So we got the React Context API, which is a part of React. You take them and compare them to a full fledged Redux like the state management solution, right? So this is a bit silly, let's just put it this way. 
But the thing is that it's not completely wrong. So sometimes you might not need Redux and all you might need in your app might be actually React context. And um, this is like the, I guess the, the article itself is actually quite good and it talks about exactly this. So it talks about, hey, if you have a very small app, if you have a very basic app that doesn't need Redux and the whole full-fledged state management, and you don't have like 2 billion components that depend on each other, all you actually need is one React context, right? That will pass down the data from top to bottom and then you can just use it, consume it, and you're done. Um, the thing is, uh, like, while, okay, it gives you introduction to the context itself, so all of that is like, again, if you're interested in context and if you're interested in, in figuring out when you can just use context, and when you can use, uh, when you need to use Redux, this article is quite good. I don't like the title anyway. So let us talk about something else because I did mention that on Twitter and a lot of people was asking me to do a stream about that, but I was again, like 36 degrees or something on Wednesday. So I was just literally just dying here on the floor. Couldn't move, not, not talking about streaming anything. But I've been recently using a tiny state management solution called Unstated. It is really small, really easy, and basically gives you just about everything you want to have from state management from, I mean, I guess, okay, it's not, it's, it's somewhere in the middle between the Redux and the just using this, the React context, right? I mean, it kind of is like using React context because it is literally based on React context and it is super simple. So instead of, of like this article that talks about building your own solution, right? So instead of doing that, you can actually just take and state it and set up the whole state management in literally three lines of code. So you just wrap your uh, parent app into the provider and then wherever you want to subscribe to state, you just subscribe to your store, whatever that is, right? And then you get the store and you can just interact with it as you would with anything else. Can I build a project with unstated instead of using Redux? That depends. So the thing is that while unstated is great and provides you all you need to build a simple app, like if you need stuff like middleware, if you need stuff, like I guess basically the only difference is middleware. So if you don't, if you don't really need middleware from uh, Redux, then yes, you can just take unstated and build a project with it. That's what I did. Actually, one of the projects we had started encountering problems with uh, create uh, React Easy State, right? And uh, we had to switch to something else and I tried unstated and it worked like a charm. It takes two seconds to rewrite it. The API is familiar because these uh, stores that you create literally use set state and have a state variable, which is like, it's just another React component essentially without a render method. It is really, really cool. So uh, do give it a shot, um, but yeah. Uh, the article is quite nice as well, so do give it a read through too. Right, continuing. Adding particle effects to DOM elements with Canvas. It's uh, essentially a Canvas tutorial, how to do neat effects on DOM elements using Canvas, uh, which actually look very nice. So, I mean, the tutorial itself is quite basic, so there's not no fancy things here. It's mostly about Canvas and, and drawing on it, right? But uh, if you are watching this on Twitch or on YouTube, you can see they do some very nice effects. And, you know, starting from a simple click effect that discharge sort of the particles out of the button, go into sort of dissolve effects with the borders and sort of slide out effects. Yeah, which looks also quite nice. So this tutorial will basically walk you through all of that. And even they yeah, publish the source code too. So if you're not interested and just want a source code, it's also here. Which is, yeah, so if you want to do some fancy canvas animation, then this is a pretty good starter. Okay, next article I got is Hello View, a quick tutorial on getting started with View. If you, for some reason, thought that Vue.js docs was not enough for you, then this article's basically what you want. It's a very simple introduction to Vue.js, very, very basic stuff, and I guess it will get you started with it. On the other hand, I would highly recommend looking at the Vue.js docs themselves because they are pretty amazing. Okay, next article we got is building renderless view components. Uh, it talks about building a Vue.js components that basically doesn't have render method and just do something with the data, uh, with the prop state or whatever, and do 
pass something on to the children. Um, you probably, if you work with React, you are using those quite heavily. Uh, again, render props is something, uh, some of a sort of a thing, especially lately in React, which is a pretty neat pattern actually. And uh, essentially, they're talking about doing more or less the same with UJS, which seems to be a bit more complicated than doing it with the React and functional components. Right, next thing we got is creating beautiful user experience with API requests. Uh, more of a meta article that talks about things you have to keep in mind when working with API requests to make a better user experience, right? Things like timeouts, how do you properly execute requests, like try to do it, try to execute requests in parallel, try to minimize the wait time, try to retry, but not too much because then user will wait a lot and so on and so on. So basically when building a UI, there is a lot of like very small details that you have to keep in mind. Otherwise the users will get annoyed or, you know, it will be sub subpar experience. And this article gives you some nice pointers on the API requests, waiting time, timeouts, retries and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Next thing we got is definitive guide to JavaScript dates because dates in JavaScript are hard as hell. And uh, yes, we have yet another guide, which, you know, is never bad. So if you ever had to work with dates in JavaScript, you know, it is a bit painful uh, to say the least. And this article, or like, I guess this guide, because it's not exactly an article, does give you an um, outline of what are the common problems? How do you get around them? And how do you work with dates to not go insane? I would personally recommend to use some sort of a wrapper library that uh, mitigates all of those problems for you because dates are not easy, not easy at all. Okay, next thing we got is why are web standards so slow? An article that looks into, well, it tries to answer the exact questions. Why are web standards moving so slowly? Why are things so slow to be accepted into the standard itself. And it gives a couple of examples. For example, um, bah, 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 um, what happens when a flexbox, uh, right to left flexbox is inside a CSS grid that an ancient CMS has put in a float that's in a display table header container. No one will ever be mad enough to do that, you say, but yes, they will. And this is basically the gist of the whole article. So if you're interested in seeing what kind of problems the um, standards committee encounters while trying to figure out the new standards and while trying to figure out how exactly they should work, do have a look at this article. It has some very interesting URIs and links to the discussions and GitHub tickets discussing the CSS standards specifically that will answer the question, why are web standards so slow to get accepted? <laughs> it is actually quite fascinating and pretty painful to see all of that stuff. All right, next thing we got is why is new V8 is so damn fast? And no, I did not put it here intendedly. That was not intended to be going after slow web standards. <laughs> so this article essentially talks about V8, uh, how it optimizes code and how you can actually uh, check for performance cliffs and check for deoptimizations in your specific code. So there's a tool called Deoptigate, which basically allows to uh, take your code and show you what happens within the V8. And there's a nice image here that basically displays that, hey, this stuff is, you know, deoptimized for wrong map. And this stuff was, okay, optimized for that. And this stuff is optimized like this. So you can actually check and uh, figure out which bits of your code can you optimize even more for the V8 engine to optimize the execution and make it even faster, which is kind of insane that it exists. But you know, if you are pushing the node to the edge, then this is probably the article you want to read. I think it's not new, by the way, but this is the first time I've seen it. It's quite a good one. All right, uh, continuing, we got a small new tweet uh, from the Firefox Nightly. Guys, so the Firefox Nightly just got time travel debugging. The thing that uh, I don't know if you know about, but the idea is that basically in, tip, in normal debugging, right, you can do step in, step over and continue execution. In time travel debugging, you can do step out and step back. So you can actually go back and forward in the app and you will not just 
see what the function was executed, but you also see the whole state of the app at the previous timeline. And you also see the whole changes in the browsers on the DOM and so on and so forth, which is kind of insane when you think about it, but apparently the Firefox Nightly team did it. So you can actually just uh, download Firefox Nightly and try it. Um, it looks kind of amazing. Uh, it is indeed awesome. Yes, I absolutely agree with it. I believe the Chrome dev team also was teasing it quite some time ago, but I don't know how that's ended and when it's coming to the release version. I think it was saying it's probably going to be there by the end of a year because it is a very large task to tackle. But I mean, come on, JavaScript tools are just getting better and better every day. Redux time, tra yeah, it is kind of like Redux time travel in the state, but just on a, you know, sort of a browser level, basically. Yeah, just a bit more complicated. Okay, the next thing we got is a really cool thread on Twitter talking about the three browsers that holding JavaScript back. So here's, there's a very interesting analysis of uh, basically the browser landscape and the most used browsers and three browsers that just won't let you compile less code. So first of all, those three browsers are Internet Explorer 11, as you might imagine, Android 4.4, and Chrome 49, which is, I have no idea why. You, you would think that Chrome is, you know, it has auto update, so it should update. Like, why is it Chrome 49? If there's, I, I don't think they actually, the thread explains why it's Chrome 49, but that would be fascinating to just have a look why. And there's also a really cool analysis saying that, hey, if you actually drop 1.44% of all users, you can remove, 20, you can go from 23 Babel transforms to just six. And here's the difference in the source code. If you just like, this is the source code that you write. This is the legacy compilation. And this is the modern version, which is just insane. Look at the code difference. It is crazy. And yeah, it's like, it's a very interesting thread. And there's a lot of sort of, uh, food for your thought here. So do have a look. It is pretty neat. And I'm still I'm so confused about Chrome 49. Why is it Chrome 49? But yeah, okay, whatever. Let's continue. Uh, the next article we got is really cool is WebAssembly the return of Java applets in flash. So there's been a lot of talks as the author notes uh, on the web generally about hey, WebAssembly is going to be the next Java applets or flash or whatever. And we got you know, JVM running within WebAssembly and whatever. I think there's already like someone already compiled like Java to JVM, right? Oh, sorry, JVM to WebAssembly. I already showed the tool like two podcast or past podcast, was it? Whatever. So you can now compile Java and run it in browser, right? So it's literally it's possible. And, and I think there's already been talks in Twitter, at least jokingly, about writing the Flash virtual machine in WebAssembly. And since there's already an open source Flash virtual machine, I'm... Guessing is, you know, just a half year more and we're going to have a, a job like WebAssembly Flash, which is actually quite great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the thing is, the author goes into uh, exploring. So why is WebAssembly better than Java applets and better than Flash, better than uh, native extensions for Chrome, better than all of those other technologies that was there? Well, Primarily because WebAssembly is actually a part of a web platform, right? It's a, it's a web standard. And yeah, there's some, some very nice images here. Shockwave player, Macromedia Shockwave. I haven't seen that image in like 10 years, I think even more. Java loading screen and this plugin is not supported thing. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of thoughts here, but it all goes down to the fact that essentially WebAssembly is something that is a part of a web platform, something that is ubiquitous and something that is already actively developed and actively used by the developer community, which is pretty fascinating. So if you're interested in knowing more why WebAssembly is good and why is it better than Java Atlas and Flash, do have a look at this article. It is a pretty good one. All right. Next thing we got is this um, Pull request to the prepack tool from Facebook. If you don't know, prepack tool is the tool that allows you to pre-process JavaScript and uh, package it for sort of with optimizations, for example, to optimize it for V8 uh, so you don't have to do it manually. Um, this is a crazy one. It adds LLVM backend, which means you can compile the JavaScript into either native machine code or WebAssembly. 
Yes, you can take your JavaScript and compile it to WebAssembly to make it run faster. <laughs> this is actually a thing. This is a thing that is happening. And uh, Freepack is very easy to use. So once this is landed, you're essentially going to be able, I imagine, to say Prepack. Here's my entry file, compile and output WebAssembly. And then you can just use your JavaScript as WebAssembly. I am very curious to see how that is going to work out and what kind of performance will this produce. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot of future work, so it's still not like completely implemented. But this is kind of amazing. And the fact that somebody even thought about doing that is just absolutely crazy. So the Facebook open source team is just incredible and all the props to them for that really gonna look close at this like watch this uh pr close and see how that ends up all right next thing we got is announcing the js sys crate uh it's from the rust team and uh we talked about their tool called basm bind gen that allows you to bind uh javascript api to rust right and they just released this js sys crate that uh, contains all the web assembly or all the javascript bindings for Rust for the uh, JavaScript, standard JavaScript environment, like web. And uh, I think it does not contain any like web and node specific API. So it's just JavaScript, like, you know, date and array value, whatever you can imagine. But the thing is that it's a start. So I imagine uh, soon we're gonna see node, JS node, sys, or I guess JS node and JS web maybe. And then you can just write Rust and compile it to WebAssembly and have it work in the browser without any problems, which is kind of insane when you think about it, but that seems to be the way that it goes. And I probably should start learning Rust like for reals because I've been trying to do that for ages and still had like zero time to do it. But yeah, um, it seems to be really neat and uh, we're gonna see gonna see. Yeah, it's gonna be, yeah, there you go. They even talk about this. It's gonna be part of WebSys which is coming soon, pretty neat. All right, next thing we got is, uh, this is actually the last article I wanna talk about today and it is not specifically JavaScript related, it's more of a, on a business logic end, I guess, a meta article. The article is called, not all bugs are worth fixing and that's okay. And it essentially talks about the fact that uh, software, is something imperfect, right? So you can never have an app that is 100% bug free. However simple your app is, however clean your code is, like, you know, even if you have 100% test coverage, there always will be bugs, there always will be problems, they might be not induced by you, they might not even be, uh, they might not even be caused by your code, it might be like, spectral vulnerability or, or whatever, right? But it still will be a bug. And the article here talks about the fact that it might be okay to not fix all of the bugs that you have. So, and goes again, this is more of a business um, logic art side article, right? So it goes into talk about, hey, don't go fixing problems that your users might never see because you're just gonna waste your own time and like, Okay, so if user is not going to see this bug fix and user will never encounter that bug, why waste your time on that? I think it's a very valid point and I've seen more than one person who spends literally months of their time fixing things and optimizing things that never got used afterwards, which was on one hand, on one hand it was actually fascinating seeing the app that worked perfectly from start to end whenever you run it and it just works even like 10 years afterwards. On the other hand, the fact that it was used like three times was very, very sad because the author spent like, you know, literally months of his time building that thing. So don't waste your time, pick the right bugs to fix, pick the right features to implement and listen to your users, I guess is what I want to say. Right, that's it for articles. We are now in the releases section and the first major release being Chrome Stable version 68, which I named 58 and just fixed <laughs> in the beginning of the stream. So um, major re uh, highlight of the browser and it's like the something that caused an insane amount of butthurt on the internet is the fact that Chrome 68 are now, is now marking all the websites that are not HTTPS as not secure. So here you have this secure badge on the top left, right? And if you don't have HTTPS, 
all the websites will now say not secure, which is, you know, if you're a software developer, you, I guess you don't really care much because you know what that means. If you're a typical average user, you're probably going to be get scared, which is, uh, I guess, a thing that uh, Chrome developers want to happen because there is too many websites that handle sensitive information without using HTTPS. And even if you have no sensitive information, even if you serve just a static website, having HTTPS is still a must in this time and day because man in the middle attack is a real thing and you know you cannot really prevent it on HTTP. But yeah, we're going to talk about that a bit more at the end of the uh, libraries and demos section because there's a new cool website related to this. Okay, next release we got is React Window version 1.0. Uh, we've talked about the beta release at some point is basically a lighter version of um, what do you call it the react virtualized so it allows you to render a lot of items but actually render just the ones that users see which is super efficient and works really nicely and it also works with the variable size and you know this like basically it's a simplified uh, react virtualized for lists right so this is this is all you need to know i guess it's really neat and very easy to use and now version 1.0. So if you need something like this, do have a look at it. Right, the next thing we got is React Select version two, a really, really good uh, selector library. My JavaScript is blocked, let me fix that. A really cool selector library for um, React that is now um, includes a bunch of additions and I, I used it in a bunch of projects. It's very nice. It default style is very neat. You can have multi-select, you can have grouped items, you can have animations, you can have whatever the hell you want. It is very easy to use and very neat. So do have a look at it if you need a drop down element. All right. Uh, the next thing we got is Keystone 4. Um, and I honestly, I think Keystone is a CMS. I honestly never worked with it. So I have no idea. Uh, you hate Judd Watson, why? <laughs> wait, wait, what is happening? Why do you hate Judd Watson? He's a pretty smart guy and doing pretty cool things. Yes, Keystone is a Node CMS and they just released version four with, I have no idea what to be honest, uh, probably with updated uh, syntax and better things. Um, it, yes, it is. The article is from Jed Watson and one of the viewers hates him for whatever reason. So I don't know. Please, I would love to know why you hate him because he, I mean, I don't know. I follow him on Twitter and he does post some very interesting things. Um, to be honest, I cannot find in the article what exactly Keystone 4 is. Why is it better over Keystone 3? But, you know, if you're using it, you probably already know. If you're not and you need a Node.js CMS, then have a look at a Keystone. They just released a new version. Hey, I'm talking about React Select version one. Um, okay, so what's up with the version one? I used the version one also, like it's been out for a while and I never had any problems with it. It worked fine with me. Right, but uh, meanwhile, let us continue the releases list. So next thing we got is Steel.js 2.0. It's um, a package manager from the guys that released CanJS framework. Um, it adds a bunch of uh, modern features, let's put it this way, like a tree shaking, MJS support, promises support, and uh, stuff like this. I mean, again, you know, it's a package manager and if you need another one, or maybe if you're using CanJS, I guess that's exciting for you. If not, then you're probably using Webpack. Uh, so I never used it personally. I've like I rarely hear about it. I think it's like third time I've heard about it. So if you're using Steel.js, please do let me know why it's good and why is it better than that pack and parcel, for example, I would be very interested. Right, next release we got is Angular version 6.1. Uh, the major highlight being TypeScript 2.9, uh, scroll positioning, retention, and uh, some other minor things like Shadow DOM view encapsulation semantic chaining and things like this. So if you're working with Angular, you probably already know about it. If not, well, then you are likely not much excited about this, but you know, TypeScript 2.9 is really nice. Right, next thing we got is Ionic 4 Beta. So we got the Ionic 4 Beta 0 for the Ionic framework. If you never used it and never heard about it, it's a mobile framework that allows you to write uh, essentially mobile apps using progressive web apps. Uh, uses web components and all that kind of stuff. It is pretty neat. So again, this is not a hybrid app. This is not um, 
sort of React Native approach. This is a pure progressive web app that just has access to the uh, phone capabilities, native things, native APIs, right? Um, but yeah, if you're looking for a cheap way to convert your web app into a phone app, then this is a way to go. And it uh, seems like Ionic 4 is going to be quite good. Uh, we're going to see how that ends up. All right. Um, I think that's it for the releases. Now we got the libraries and demos section. And the first uh, thing that we have today is something we already talked about. It's uh, NDB, improved debugging experience for Node.js from the Google Chrome Labs. Uh, so the Google guys released their own debugging thing and it essentially just launches the Chrome DevTools that are automatically plugged into your node and all you have to do to debug it, you just prefix whatever you run with NDB and that's it. So I guess the simplicity of use is the core proposition of this because there's been a lot more tools that did it, but they all required some sort of a setup and didn't really work with like testing frameworks and other things, or at least not out of the box. So you had to spend some time configuring this, but this one seems to be working just with one command, which is pretty amazing. So yeah, have a look at this if you are into a uh, hardcore debugging. <clears throat> all right, next thing we got is, yeah, this is insane. The library is called React PDF. It literally allows you to create PDFs from React components. And yes, it just, as you might imagine, you literally create a document. It has uh, specific uh, classes for like document, page, text, view, style sheet. And then you just say render and you render it to PDF. So it has a PDF render. You can render PDFs using React. There you go. It, it's like, and I mean, come on. There, there was, wait a second. There was a try. Yeah, there was, they, they just published this. Uh, come on, where's my, why don't, why it doesn't work? <gasps> no, they broke it. It was a live. Oh, there, there's a playground. I, I think that should work, right? There we go. Uh, so they have a playground where you can actually test it right on the web. And let me just unlock the JavaScript. And uh, just look at this. It renders a PDF with styles, with images, with headers, and with with everything else. It is insane. Like, what the what the actual hell? Look at this. It is so easy to write. This is kind of incredible that you can do this with the React paradigm. It's like, again, this is not the React itself, right? We're talking about the React approach. So if you need to create PDFs, have a look at the React PDF. It's pretty awesome. And it also works on React Mobile, it seems. So React Native. Uh, yeah. Right, next thing we got is uh, devhints.io, a really neat little website that contains a bunch of cheat sheets. Uh, there's a cheat sheets for just about everything that you can imagine, starting from React, going to Docker Compose, Docker Files, PM2, VS Code, whatever. And they are actually very nicely formatted. So um, I found it to be pretty neat. It also looks really nice, very neat design. So, you know, if you if you like cheat sheets and if you uh, frequently look up things and have a look at this one, maybe you'll find the ones that you really like because I, I found it to be pretty nice. Nice is, is a night and... No, wait, nice and neat. I mean, nice, no, that, that's wrong. All right, let's continue. Next thing we got is ray tracing. Uh, let me try that again. Ray tracing, WebAssembly versus JavaScript. Really neat experiment to see the difference between the speed of work, uh, WebAssembly versus JavaScript ray tracers. Uh, so if you're not familiar, the ray tracing is the technique of rendering 3D objects when you literally trace the rays from the viewer's stand of point to create those objects. It is very expensive and very slow. Hence why we only have like six FPS here, right? And this is the WebAssembly version. But if you switch to JavaScript, you immediately see that WebAssembly is actually really fast. And I would be very interested to see if uh, first the author can optimize it even more. And second, if the uh, this page is basically gonna get faster with the new releases of WebAssembly, with the new releases of browsers, because I'm, I'm guessing it will, right? So for now, it's like two and a half time difference, I guess, more or less. But yeah, pretty neat one. It also has the source code on GitHub. So if you're interested in uh, checking it out, you can do have a look. Right, next thing we got is um, Vialer, Vialer. I guess it's Vialer JS because it's like Dialer, but Vialer, right? It's hard to pronounce. So it's a pluggable WebRTC communication platform. So if you want to set up your own Call communication platform like WebRTC calls, live calls, multi-person calls and all that kind of stuff. You can actually do it with this 
uh, open source thing. So I don't know how good the documentation for it are, but it seems to be relatively straightforward to set it up, you know. So if you're looking into something like this and want to have it in-house, do we have a look at this one? It seems to be pretty nice. Okay, next thing we got is Unswitch. Tiny event handler for switch controllers on the web. Essentially just a game a gamepad API wrapper uh, that is built specifically for switch controllers and that allows you to handle uh, switch inputs easier on the web. So, you know, if you're working for something for switch uh, in the browser, I don't know why would you do that right now because switch doesn't really have browser yet unless you uh, jailbreak it, but that's a bit of a pain in ass. But yeah, you know, if you if you're into this, do have a look. The API seems to be pretty nice. All right, so next thing we got is SL, a tiny command line utility to list all the available uh, scripts from npm uh, from the package JSON in your uh, project. Which I I guess it's nice. I mean, I always use cat package JSON and that's it. That's it's usually enough. But I guess maybe my package JSON is not that large, so maybe you'll find it useful. All right, next thing we got is uh, Appy, a library submitted by one of the viewers. Thank you for the submission. The next open source file uploader for web browser. Seems to be a really neat uh, tiny web, uh, like file, why am I saying web? No, it's just a file uploader. So you can actually file, like it has a very nice reach file selector, has a support for uploading from links, from Google Drive, from Instagram, from camera, whatever the hell you want and uh, has a pretty nice api so you know if you are doing a lot of file uploads and all of those are seems to be pluggable so if you're doing a lot of file uploads then have a look maybe uh, it will simplify your life quite a bit uh, it has, seems to have a lot of sources actually so there's like google drive dropbox uh, aws s3 as a uploader uh, ui elements uh, okay so it's it's highly pluggable seems like you can do just about everything you want with it that's really neat Thank you for submitting this. It's a pretty cool library. Right, next thing we got is Wretch, a tiny wrapper built around fetch with an intuitive syntax. So we already talked about Axios today. We talked about God.js. Uh, we talked about node fetch. We'll now talk about Wretch. So if you are not, um, if you're not a fan of large libraries, if you just want something tiny, then this one is 2.69 kilobyte minified and gzipped. <clears throat> it's a very small wrapper around fetch. It has a very nice API, so um, it has a very nice handling for errors and has some pretty neat, uh, basically it's, you know, it's a sh syntactic sugar for fetch. So if you don't really want to handle all this stuff yourself, which, you know, I typically don't, especially if I have something more complex than getting JSON from the response, then I go for some wrapper. And this one seems to be quite nice. I usually used fetchival before but i don't know how big is it actually because i don't really care much about the size at the time uh no it's actually fetchival is actually smaller uh, but i don't know like fetchival doesn't have that many features at least so it's, it's a very straightforward one a rage seems to be way more feature reach and well slightly bigger which is not critical all right next thing we got is excel for node node module to allow for easy excel file creation so if you are not satisfied with building React, uh, with building PDFs with React, you can create Excel sheets from the nodes, uh, which is uh, like maybe you have some use case. I don't know. Like I haven't been working with Excel files for ages, but um, at least I've been I've been parsing them, but I haven't been writing them for ages because. Yeah, I guess that's just not the area I work with, but this library provides you everything you need to work with Excel files. And you know, you can create worksheets, you can manipulate cells, formulas and all of that stuff. And even include images, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, but yes, all of it works and it supports a bunch of formats, uh, OpenOffice, Microsoft XS, XSLX, so the latest uh, format and so on and so forth. So it's pretty cool. Right, the next library we got is JS inspect, detect copy pasted and structurally similar code. So it's a command line tool that allows you to find duplicated code in your project. Um, can be useful, but once again, I think that uh, duplication is not that terrible, especially if you uh, do it reasonably. So if you don't, like if you abstract, like the, <laughs> the rule that I typically have is I start abstracting after I have four or five times the same code. 
then you know for sure that this is something that's going to be reused again and again and you can abstract it into a new nice either function or class or whatever the correct abstraction there right so it's I think it's way more harmful to abstract into wrong abstraction early because that's just going to bring more pain than uh, be helpful. So it's not there's nothing wrong with copy pasting a few times is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, this tool is a nice thing to inspect uh, larger projects, I guess. Right, next thing we got is node inline CPP, a node module that allows you to inline C++ code into JavaScript. Uh, it is very early, so version 0.1.6 uh, in the very beginning of its lifespan, I guess. It basically allows you to use template literal compile to write C++ code and um, yeah, execute it within Node.js. I like, I is just crazy. I don't know how it works. I haven't checked yet. It looks really neat. I want to check it out. And um, I don't know why you would want that, <laughs> but it looks really awesome. And as an experiment, it's just really cool. Okay, next thing we got is simple data table, lightweight and very simple data table with no dependencies uh, looks quite like this. So you have um, a yeah, very simple table that you can edit and change and add more rows and add more columns and stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, they're very straightforward APIs so nothing really complicated here. Right, next thing we got is JSQR, a pure JavaScript QR code reading library. So if you ever needed to read QR codes in your progressive web app, then this is the thing to use. Seems to be very straightforward to use and accepts the uh, binary data. Um, the image is uh, basically, yeah, uint 8 clamped array, which uh, should be quite easy. So image data is basically what you want, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, so seems very straightforward and uh, should work relatively well, I guess. I mean, QRs are very error, uh, have a very high error um, allowance. So, you know, basically that, there you go. Was, I'm getting overheated, I think. It's, it's getting hot again. No, please. Right, let's continue. The next thing we got is ViewStick Admin, a Vue.js admin dashboard. So it's a full-fledged open source dashboard uh, for admin interface built in Vue.js and Bootstrap 4. Um, quite nice. It's like has a lot of elements, forms, form wizards, to maps, chat, whatever the hell you might imagine. So basically everything you might need ever in the admin dashboard, you can just take it, fork it and uh, create your admin dashboard from it. I never needed anything like that, but uh, maybe you do. All right, next thing we got is Percy. So this is actually a Rust and WebAssembly a toolkit for building isomorphic web apps, uh, which is kind of crazy. So the cool thing about this is that it's literally the, it has the virtual DOM implementation in Rust included. Um, and it compiles the WebAssembly as you might imagine. And look at this, <laughs> this looks like React, which is really awesome. I mean, you can now write React in, in, um, in Rust, which is, you know, hey, I won't complain about that. That looks really cool. So yeah, if you ever wanted to play with, um, maybe you're using Rust, maybe you wanted to get into it, uh, that looks really awesome. Right, uh, yes, there we go. The last thing we got on the list is this Why No HTTPS website. It is a collection of the world's most popular websites that are loaded insecurely. So basically people decided that, hey, um, or I guess security experts, I should say, because it's built by uh, quite uh, high profile security experts, um, that you actually now have to name and shame the websites that are not using HTTPS because come on, it's it's 2018. You can get HTTPS from Let's Encrypt for free and it's really easy to set up and there's no reason to be not using it. There's actually a lot of reason to be using it uh, starting from the, you know, um, hijack, like the credential hijacks, going to man in the middle attacks, going to the content hijacks and so on and so forth. So there's a... A bunch of articles, it also, oh, sorry, the bunch of links to the uh, websites, as you might imagine, most of them are Chinese because Chinese never use HTTPS because the great Chinese big brother and all of that stuff. Um, there is quite a lot of USA websites here, amusingly enough. And uh, you can also look at the websites by your country, which is also quite interesting. And there is I'm kind of curious, how's the Germany there? Um, Okay, there's some of them here. Yeah, it's like convert to MP3 net. That's German website. Okay, Spiegel.de is actually not 
Yeah, it is not secure. That is that is interesting. That is very interesting. I wonder why are they not running HTTPS? I guess they're gonna be changed soon, maybe. And if you're wondering why you should run HTTPS, well, there you go. So this is the um, thing that, you know, think people intercepting unencrypted traffic is rare, go to an airport. And uh, there you go, there's a very <laughs> shining example of what you can do with uh, unsecure connections, like inject this cryptin.com thing that would basically do something to the user browser connection, right? It's like, uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> like, okay, so if you're interested in more details on why HTTPS is important, go to Troy Hunt, uh, look up his website. I think it's troyhunt.com. Yeah, there you go. He has more than one article talking about why HTTPS is important, why you should be using it, and what kind of things you can do with, uh, with the websites that don't have HTTPS. So there's... <laughs> It's a really fascinating article. Here's why your static website needs HTTPS. And uh, it's also like follow, if you if you use Twitter a lot, follow Troy on Twitter because he has some incredible conversations with people who claim that they don't need HTTPS. There's like some quotes here. They are very amusing. Highly recommended read. Okay, um, that's it for the libraries and demos. Now we have some silly and um, interesting stuff that is not purely JavaScript. Uh, so the first thing was, uh, or is, is the Rockstar Programming Language Specification. So someone created a Rockstar Programming Language, is a dynamically typed Turing complete programming language, right? Is designed to create computer programs that are also song lyrics and is heavily influenced by the radical conventions of 1980s hard rock and power ballads. Just remember this for a second. So here's the reason why it was created. Uh, mainly, Rockstar was created because if we made Rockstar a real thing, a real programming language, then recruiters and hiring managers won't be able to talk about Rockstar developers anymore. I think this is just amazing. Now, this is not even the best part of it. So, yeah, first of all, you can be now a rock certified Rockstar developer. So I think I should open the certification center and open a certified, get a certified Rockstar developer uh, certificate. Uh, that's not even the coolest part. So this is an actual language spec like a proper full language spec that should compile if you implement uh, like interpreter or compiler or whatever. And the cool thing, they have examples here. So they have a FizzBuzz example that looks boring and they have a FizzBuzz example that looks amazing. So here's a FizzBuzz example. I'm reading the code to you right now. Midnight takes your heart and your soul. While your heart is as high as your soul, put your heart without your soul into your heart. Give back your heart. <laughs> And it goes like this, and this is Fizz Buzz. It is freaking amazing. Just like, just go follow the link and read that. This is just so awesome. Like this is actual code and you can compile it. Just think about that for a second. You can like, um, you know what? I wanna create a rock band that would literally sing um, Fizz Buzz <laughs> written in this language. It's just so good. Okay, um, yeah, but it, it's like, it's really cool. I think I should implement, like we probably should should collaborate on implementing the actual uh, the actual compiler or interpreter or something. There's actually seven pull requests here. I'm at, oh, oh my God, there's people extending the language already, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, nested functions and closures. Okay, let's have a look. I'm really curious. Um, I'll change. Um, okay, yeah, that is, <laughs> people are going all in on this language. All right, uh, so the next thing we got is a pretty neat uh, Hacker News thread. It's called Ask Hacker News Any Good Examples of Learning Through Games Puzzles for Adults and um, essentially talks about learning anything through games or puzzles. And there's a lot of really cool things here that I um, personally didn't know about, most of them actually. So there's, for example, this clapping music app that teaches uh, how to perform a piece of contemporary music uh, from ground up as you might imagine from the app using clapping, right? There's also really cool, uh, like the uh, the human resource machine is something that teaches you the assembly language concept. So if you never uh, ever learned assembly and if you want to learn it through games, then I highly recommend human resource machine. It's available on just about everything. Like I think Android phones, PC um, consoles, like even Switch probably, but Basically, it's a really, really cool game, really fun to work with. 
And uh, yeah, also Zactronics. So if you never heard about the, um, I guess it's a team of people. They produce incredible games. Like the games from them are just insanely good. All of them are essentially programming games in some form or shape. And uh, they are actually, they have a new one upcoming soon. So this, yeah, I, I there's a Shenzhen IO review or like a let's play on my YouTube channel. And this game literally makes you uh, chi work for Chinese guys who produce microcontrollers. So it tasks you with building microcontroller from ground up, from the very basic elements to programming it to, and yeah, it has a solid term embedded. It has a manual that is like 30 pages and without printing it, without looking at it, you will not be able to progress. This is like literal microcontroller programming. Uh, I think it's very similar to actually what we had in the university when I was like doing microcontrollers course. It is really neat and um, some people are making insane things with it. So like it, it has it has some really, really incredible stuff and it's really fun. So like if you, if you enjoy things like this, I highly recommend that. It also has like Opus Magnum, which is a more like alchemy themed, more logical than programming, uh, but you also like build builders. So it's kind of neat. And uh, they have an upcoming game that is called Exapunks. It seems to be about programming robots, which is also something that I am freaking excited about. And I absolutely would love to try that. So we're going to see once it releases in August, uh, if I can get my hands on it or not. And uh, maybe we're going to stream a bit of that. So yes, Zachtronics is highly recommended. And yeah, there's like a billion other links in here. So it's a really, really large thread and a lot of people are recommending a lot of pretty neat stuff. All right, and before we wrap this up, uh, yes, Zachtronics games are all have a really, really good UIs and all have a very distinct style. So you will like, just trust me, you will enjoy them. Highly recommend. It. All right, before we wrap this stream up, I have um, something terrifying. <laughs> So you remember this Spectre and Meltdown attacks on CPUs, right? Well, somebody figured out, uh, pfft, let me try that again. Somebody figured out how to execute Spectre to leak the secrets over the network. Yep, you can, you can do that. So your CPU, and when the next time when I hear someone say, oh, but I don't wanna apply this Spectre patch to my windows because it will slow me down 15%, well, 15% slowdown is better than leaking your secrets over network, don't you think? So if you are interested in learning more details, then uh, Ars Technica as always has a very in-depth article talking about uh, what is the vulnerability and sort of the basic details and how it works. So, uh, yeah, so if you are interested to have a look, there is uh, some pretty neat details here and uh, gives you sort of a perspective on how this works. Right, that is basically it from my side. That was all for today's BXGS Weekly. If you guys have any other links that I might have missed, this is your chance to throw them into the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I will be more than happy to answer them. If not, then um, yeah, as always, you can send your links prior to the weekly to GitHub channel or to whatever, um, whatever the <laughs> communication methods that you find to me. Um, more than happy to cover your personal stuff. As usual, if you missed any links from today, the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube, to Dev2, to SoundCloud and CastBox. All the links are available on GitHub. You can find them over there. You can just click them through yourself if you want to. And uh, yeah, that's basically all I have for today. All right, seems like no questions, no more links. Uh, then thank you very much for watching. Thank you guys very much for your support as usual. Um, I guess that will be it for today. It is still really, really hot in Germany. It is like 36 degrees. I think I said it already 25 times today, but I'm literally melting here. We don't, I, I probably should buy air conditioner or something. This is just too, too hard for me. <laughs> just gonna go lie down somewhere. Um, yeah, that's basically all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, send me over your links, your projects and your cool things that you found over the next week uh, using the GitHub, Twitter, Discord server or whatever you like. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.